Welcome to my channel. I want to talk about the Dallas Cowboys embarrassing loss to the Detroit Lions, or excuse me, to the Green Bay Packers. But before I do that, I have to thank each and every one of you for coming to my channel. Thank you for watching my videos. Thank you for liking them, for sharing them, for commenting. And thank you especially to those of you, <clears throat> excuse me, who have subscribed to my channel. I, you have no idea how much I appreciate it. I really, really do. So, <clears throat> I wanna give you a little background so you understand where I'm coming from. I was born and raised in the Washington, D.C. area. So, I was a Washington Redskins fan. And to give you an idea how much of a Redskins fan I was, I'm going to show you a brief clip from 1973, if you can believe that, of a play that I will never forget when Kenny Houston stopped Walt Garrison on the one-yard line on fourth down to preserve a victory for the Redskins. So I found that play on YouTube, and we're going to watch it. Greg Morton rallied the Cowboys, and with 29 seconds still remaining, he stood facing fourth down at the Washington four-yard line. Morton's play was a rollout designed to get the ball to Walt Garrison, a man so tough he played in the Super Bowl with a broken collarbone and gained more than 100 yards. And suddenly, as if in a cockeyed dream, there was Ken Houston restraining Garrison at the one-yard line and throwing him back to preserve a victory that had been celebrated long before the final gun. <laughs> yeah, that is my memory of the Redskins. You think about that, that's 1973, so that's 50 years ago, and I still remember it like it was yesterday. That's how big a deal it was. Over the years, as I got older, I became more of a football fan than a fan of a particular team. And since I've lived in Dallas for almost 30 years now, <clears throat> I've learned to uh, I, I've come to watch the Cowboys and pay attention to what they're doing, but I would not consider myself a fan. I'm more of a, um, how shall I put it, a somewhat unbiased critic. Okay? So when I watched the Cowboys game and I watched how they played in that game, I thought to myself, I'm not surprised. I've seen this before. This team just has a knack for throwing away games they should win. And so today I want to talk about that briefly. First, we're going to listen to uh, a part of <clears throat> Mike McCarthy's press conference where he talks about the game. Your meeting with Jerry yesterday, was it talking a lot about you in a fifth season? Was that a, a brief part of it? It was like, hey, what, what are you looking for? What do we need to do here? Uh, it, was a, it was a long meeting. Uh, I think we went uh, probably a little bit past three hours. Uh, we talked about a number of topics. I mean, the first topic was obviously the disappointment um, of the ending of the season. You know, went through all the layers of that. Um, then we talked about you know, pretty much everything in the football program. So it was more looking forward and, and just where what well, happened and then what what initially. Yeah, what I think I think it. Um, you know, we we went we went to. The whole course, you know, uh, went back through, you know, things that we felt you know, may have factored, and um, like I said, it, the the disappoint the disappointment component had a lot of layers to it. So we went through all those layers, um, and then we, you know, talked about personnel and coaches and everything involved. So business affairs, and so like I said, it was a it was a, it was a long, productive conversation. I know a lot of veteran coaches in your position. Um, feel it's important not to be, not to go into a final year to want an extension. Can you talk about working without an extension in this final year and any complications? That well, you? I think the biggest thing is, you know, and, I, and I've been asked this for 20 years or ever how long um, those questions pertain. I, I've, I've never talked about a player's contract, um, coach's contract. I mean, I, I'm not going to start today 
but I, I will say I am very uh, confident in the direct direction, um, and and I, I like where we are, you know, as far as um, moving forward. Uh, so I'm I'm very confident where I am. Clarence, a four-star telegram. Can you talk about what the last few days have been like, and and for you and your family? With so you can watch the rest of that if you want. I'll put the links in the in the description, including the Walt Garrison one. Uh, but <clears throat> I want to talk about my approach to the game. Oh, where did it go? Oh, there we go. Um, because I'm not particularly a fan of any given team, I try to pay more attention to the technical aspects of the game and understand what's going on. And I came across these uh, tweets by Kurt Warner, who, if you don't know Kurt Warner, he's a former NFL quarterback. Uh, I believe he's in the Hall of Fame. And he is analyzing the two interceptions that the Dallas Cowboys had. And I think his analysis is quite interesting. And so I'm going to play the first one, not the second one so that you can see what he's talking about. All right, uh, you know I'm all about the details, and so I thought I would go back and take a look at these two interceptions by the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, let's take a look at the first one. Um, now, again, I know they always say there's many ways to skin a cat. I'm sure there are. Uh, I just kind of know what's best in my mind, what's best in my mind for a quarterback, uh, to thought process, the details that make sense to me. So there may be other people out there that have a reason for doing things the other way. I'd love to hear them. I'd love to challenge what I'm thinking, but I'm very steadfast in why I would do what I do and why the details become so important. Okay. So on this particular play, we're going to have, uh, Michael Gallup come down here and he's going to run a shallow route, okay? So he's gonna return to become part of the backside concept. The front side concept is what we call a return by Brandon Cook. So he's gonna run out here and start as if he's running a quick out and then he's gonna return back to the ball. C.D. Lamb is gonna come off of him and run a corner route over the top of it, okay? So let's take a look real quick, you see it, okay? So Brandon Cooks is starting out and then the corner's over the top and then the return comes, okay? First thing that I'll say is I never use a return route as my first read because it takes too long. He's coming up and he's going out and then he's returning back here. And so I'm always going to read something else inside of it first, what, whatever that is, because even if I, I want to throw the return, um, you know, I got to read whatever is in that area and I want to clear that area out. So when you're, you're running or, or designing plays, you always want to ask the question, who's my primary receiver? So for me on this, my primary receiver is going to be this corner route. In other words, I want to try to get the corner route. And then if I don't have the corner route, then I've got this return that will be replacing where he's going or where he's you know, running his stem. And I'm replacing there. And because of the timing purposes of it, return's not going to be my, fav my, my, you know, my first because of the timing. So whatever that is that's going vertical or over the top, I'm going to read that first and then come back to the return, okay? So that becomes very, very important. So, uh, you know, so here, we've got the return, okay? Which again, it's just starting out, it's gotta come all the way back. I've got the corner route over the top of it. So on this particular play, Dallas has another play. They actually ran it in this game, what I call otter. So it's, instead of Brandon Cooks running a return, he's gonna run an out, and then C.D. Lamb would run a corner over the top. So an out and a corner is what I call otter, okay? So on that particular play, uh, as I come out, I'm going to read the corner on that look. Now, I'm going to stop this for just a minute because I want to talk about what he's talking about. In football, there's only so many ways you can skin a cat. And you can rest assured that the defense is well, as well aware of those ways as you are. So what you have to do on offense is you have to figure out a way to put one of the defenders in a compromised position. What I mean by that is you have to place him in a position where he has to make a decision to go in one direction or another depending on the play. And then you throw to the direction he's not going to because that's what's open. So 
that's going to be important when you continue to watch this and pay attention to what Kurt says. Okay, I'm going to read that outside defender. So I'm going to come out and on out and corner, I'm going to read the out first, okay, because it happens first, right? And it's off of this guy. So if this guy drops back, I'm taking the out, okay? I'm taking the out. If I'm going to take the out and I read this guy and he drives the out, then I'm going to hit the corner up over the top. So it's a simple high-low off of this outside defender. Now, this play is the complementary to that play because, you see, we're making it look exactly the same. So as a quarterback, my read should be exactly the same in terms of who I'm reading. So I'm still reading this outside defender here uh, just like I would with the out and the corner. The difference is because this isn't an out, it's a return and it takes longer, now I'm flipping how I'm trying to read this. So I'm flipping it and saying, okay, I'm running this to try to get the corner. Okay, the other one, I'm running it to get the out. If he jumps the out, I'm throwing the corner. On this one, because it's a return, I'm running it to get the corner. So I want this guy to jump the return and I wanna read the corner first. And then if this guy falls off, then I recover to the later route based on timing to my return. Okay, so as we come out, I should be on Jair Alexander right here. And, and right now, right now, he has stopped his feet. His hips are parallel to the line of scrimmage. He is driving this out portion of uh, the play. So if, I was, if we had the out in the corner here, he's jumping it, I'm throwing the corner, right? I, I'm already seeing it and jumping the corner. So the read should be exactly the same. I'm reading the same guy here. If he doesn't drop back, I am thinking corner, and my thought process on this play, again, because it's a return, is corner first, then return. So right here, in my opinion, Dak should be throwing or reading the corner, taking a shot at the corner. This guy is already committed to this route. There's your corner route. There's nobody else out here, right? That's why we run this. We're trying to pull down everything else that's out by the numbers. There is nothing else there except uh, C.D. Lamb. That, to me, is the throw right there. Okay, now one thing that can kind of mess this up a little bit is you notice that Brandon Cooks is in front of C.D. Lamb. So that's a hard thing here because if we're reading the corner first, I would like the corner to go first. Now, you have to change up your release patterns all the time, so I get it. I understand you change it up. But we really want the corner to be happening a little bit faster because you see corner isn't quite breaking out yet until this guy's on the return. So that's something that can mess with the quarterback because he's like, okay, the return's coming out of it. I want to throw it on time and my corner's not quite there. But regardless, if I'm reading this defender and he jumps down, my throw should be up over the top to the corner. If I don't have it, I should work to the backside right here. Okay. So that's the first part obviously leads to an interception. Okay. Here's a second part that is important to me. And now I understand that we're trying to make this look exactly like the otter concept. So I'm trying to push this guy up five yards and grab the corner. That makes sense to me. Uh, all I would say is the hardest thing is when we run in a return because defenders like to sit at five, six yards. So the toughest thing when we're running a return is to run our route to five or six yards and then break out and come back under because it's hard to get back underneath the defender that's sitting at that depth. That's the depth they want to sit at. So to me, we either got to push them past that depth or we've got to run the route short of that depth. Okay. Now, that is something that the receiver should understand and he should plan the way he runs his routes based on that understanding. But Brandon Cooks fails to do that. Keep watching. Okay, so we got a corner over the top, so I don't want to push this deeper. But I would like to see Brandon Cooks run this shorter. Now, again, I said, I understand the details of why we would want to make it look exactly the same. But I would cheat this a little bit. And what I would want here is I would want Brandon Cooks to get width right now and be flatter. Okay, so not quite as much depth and get width. So when he gets width, right, that's what makes this guy commit. Once I get outside of him, this guy's got to make a decision. If I'm outside of him and he wants to go back, he's given me, in, in most the out, right? Again, we're not talking about the return because it's really based off of the out. But if I get outside of him and he goes back, this out is open every time. So once we get outside of him, that's what makes him commit. Um, that's what gives us our read. So I would like to see him get flatter and wider right now. I would like to see him not get as much depth. 
because you see how he's getting to the depth where he's about two yards away from Jair Alexander. And when he comes out of it, see how Jair Alexander doesn't have to come up the field, doesn't have to attack Brandon Cooks. He's sitting in his same spot and can cover this. We always want to make defenders move. They make them come to us. Otherwise, we're going to win. So I always talk about it's width and depth. Width of this defender, but he also has to cover some sort of depth. Get deep, come you know, come up, whatever. So I'd love to see Brandon Cooks get a little wider here, not go quite as deep, almost as if it's more of a flat route. Two to three yards, get outside here, flatter. Why? What does that do? Okay, so I get out here flatter. I'm outside of Jair Alexander. He's got to make a decision one way or another. But the key to that is when I'm coming back in. So if I'm two, two yards shorter here, Brandon Cooks, so Jair Alexander's on the eight, and I'm on the five, and I'm running this return. I have three yards of space to be able to get out of this and get back underneath Jair Alexander, right? See here, Brandon Cooks ends up falling all the way to seven and a half, eight yards, right where Jair Alexander is. So he doesn't have to cover any depth. He doesn't have to chase down to cut this off. He can sit kind of in his spot. So here, he's able to match and undercut this or, or beat uh, Brandon Cooks to the spot. If Brandon Cooks takes this flatter, in my opinion, and wider right here, boom, right now, get this guy moving this way towards the numbers, then he's also got to come down to close the gap. Now you return back underneath him, and it's much easier to beat him underneath and you know get that leverage that you... So basically what he's saying in my opinion, and I'm not a football, I'm not a technical expert, and I don't claim to be one, and if there's someone in the comments that wants to correct me, that's fine, I don't care. But basically what he's saying is that the receiver isn't running a route that puts pressure on the defender, and that's what you have to do to get open. You've got to force the defender to make a decision to cover in one direction or another and then when you change direction he can't catch up fast enough and you catch the ball. What Brandon Cooks did was he ran to the defender and then turned. Well the defender's right there. He's basically running the same route the receiver's running and he won the route. He caught the ball. So that leads me to the question who screwed up? Was it Brandon Cooks or was it the coaches who didn't scheme it correctly? And Brandon Cooks is a pretty experienced receiver, so I have to wonder, are the coaches not teaching these receivers the basics? I mean, this is pretty basic stuff. If you're a receiver, you want to put the defender in a compromised position so then, once the defender is in a compromised position, you can run your route and you'll be open to catch the pass. So, it doesn't make sense to me. Brandon Cook should know what to do. He's been a receiver for a long time in the league, so it makes me wonder if the Cowboys are correctly scheming these plays. And that's a coaching problem. Um... The other possibility is, and this could be true because when you watch the way they played, they played like they were sleepwalking through the game, is that the players came out flat. They weren't prepared to play. And there's some justification for that thinking. The Cowboys actually had a victory party planned before the game, which tells you something about their mindset. They had already assumed that they were going to win, when the only thing you can assume in the NFL is that you're going to have a tough game. I don't care who the opponent is. You can never assume you're going to win, because if you do that, you're halfway to losing already. But anyway, the Cowboys had a mindset that said, this is going to be easy, and it wasn't easy, and they got smacked in the face, and they it took them three quarters to recover. But maybe... That's the explanation is that Brandon Cooks was just running a lazy route. He wasn't really trying real hard, uh, you know, for whatever reason. Now, Kurt also talks about the second interception, which I blame that one entirely upon Dak because 
he was staring down C.D. Lamb the entire time. And it was obvious who he was going to throw the ball to. And so the receiver, the uh, defender came off of his man and just undercut the route, and boom, he was gone to score a touchdown. Um, but there are bigger issues with the Cowboys. This is the third year in a row that they've gone 12-5 and five, and the third year in a row that they've gone out in the first game of the playoffs. So that causes people to speculate about all sorts of things. Some people think Mike McCarthy should be fired. Some people think they should get rid of Dak Prescott. Um, I think both of those are overreactions. I think Dak, Dak Prescott is a great quarterback, as he showed during the season. But there is a problem with this team, and that is that when they get superior competition or equal competition, they tend not to play well. And that, to me, is a coaching issue. The coaches have got to figure out how to get these players motivated and prepared enough that when they go into a tough game, they're going to play tough to the end and they're going to win. Until they do that, they're not going anywhere. So I would assume at this point Mike McCarthy has one year left on his contract, and if they don't go past the first round of the playoffs next year or don't even get into the playoffs, he'll be gone. If they do go past the first round, then maybe he'll get to stay. It just depends on how far they go. And Dak Prescott is never going to get rid of the tag of a choker until he manages to win a playoff game. And that's unfortunate for him. It's a lot of pressure, but, you know, it comes with the territory. You're making $160 million contract, and your next contract's going to be even bigger. You need to perform. I don't care who you are. I don't care, you know, what your psyche is or anything else. With that kind of money, you need to perform, plain and simple. So this year, the Cowboys will be sitting on the sidelines watching the games. Don't. Sleep on Green Bay. They could go into San Francisco and beat the 49ers. They've already proven they can beat the Cowboys. Now, the 49ers don't tend to be chokers in hard games, but the Green Bay is going to give them everything they can, get, they can handle and more. So I would not sleep on Green Bay. It's, it's absolutely possible that they could beat the San Francisco in this next game. So that's my take. Uh, you know, I really love football. I really do. But I love the game. I don't love an individual team. And I don't cheer for individual teams, with the exception of the Colorado Buffaloes. And that's because of Dion. I think Dion is a fantastic man, and I love what he's doing in Colorado. <clears throat> I think he's changing college football for the better. He is unabashedly Christian, and I like that. And he's unabashedly prays in front of his, his players and talks about God in front of his players. And I don't care if that makes the atheist mad too bad. It's absolutely his right to do that. So... I will be following Colorado, and I'll be making more Colorado videos as the time goes by. Uh, but I don't know that I'll make any more NFL videos because I'm just not that into the NFL anymore. Um, I got disappointed in them <clears throat> in the way that they've handled some things. And I've just kind of lost interest. I mean, I, I watch them from a, uh, how would you put it? Uh, disinterested perspective. Eh, whatever. There's nothing else on, so I'll watch a game. We'll see what they do. But I don't care about the outcomes. Don't care about who wins, who loses. Don't care about the teams. Just the way it is. Now that's enough for today. As for you, my viewers, I pray right now that you will be abundant, that you'll live an abundant life, and that you'll have a long life, and that you'll be healthy, and that God will keep you safe from harm, 
And I also pray that he'll do the same for every single person that you love. And I pray most of all that you will be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, you will let your request be made known to God. And the peace that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. This is the Vietnam Era Vet, out.